Hi, so in this video we're going to do some constrained optimization, everyone's favorite topic. So we're going to be doing optimization over two periods as we're in an intertemporal model, which means that we're optimizing consumption between period one and period two. So for starters in this model, we assume that our lifetime utility is additively separable. This means that we can write the utility of our consumer as the utility of period or the utility from period one consumption plus some factor multiplied by utility of period two consumption, if my pen would work properly. So we are here additively separable because we are we have these two separate terms that are added together and we're separating utility from consumption in each period. And here we have beta is between 1 and 0, and this is what we call a discount factor. And this means that we're effectively weighting utility uh, from period 2 consumption as slightly less than utility from period 1 consumption. Um, intuitively, this basically just says that we value utility higher in period 1, and there's a number of reasons why uh, that would be. But naturally, if you just to keep it simple, so if if you could have some some money right now or or at some point in the future, people would tend to have that money right now. So we we value period to consumption slightly less, and we make some restrictions about our utility function. So it's strictly concave, which means that the second derivative is negative. And we also assume that the first derivative is positive. So if we increase consumption of if we increase consumption in either period one or period two, we're going to increase our utility function. Uh, that's implied by this condition. Uh, but it's, we're going to do that at a decreasing rate. We have diminishing returns to consumption. So we are strictly concave. And so we can set up the consumer problem which is where we maximize the utility of the consumer subject to their budget constraint. So the consumer problem is given by this. We maximize C1 and C2 in the equation that we're maximizing. We're maximizing utility. So we're maximizing this equation as we wrote above. Subject to the, the budget constraint, and we derived that in a previous video, uh, this is the intertemporal budget constraint that the present value of consumption has to equal present value income. So how do we solve this maximization problem? So we could do the Lagrangian method and do a constrained optimization and take uh, a couple of first order conditions, but that that would take a little bit more time than the method I have in mind. It's a lot simpler to rearrange the budget constraint and to then substitute that in to our, to our utility function. And then we can just take one first order condition with respect to the one variable we have remaining. So if we use our intertemporal budget constraint, and which is given here, then we can isolate C2 on one side of the equation and then substitute it in to our utility function. So we can rearrange this equation by multiplying through by 1 plus r and then subtracting our 1 plus r multiplied by c1 term. And we can rearrange to get something that looks like this, 1 plus r. And we're going to take out a factor. I won't show all the steps to this working. You should be able to do this rearranging no problem. We're we're just going from the intertemporal budget constraint to this, and now we're going to substitute this into our utility function for C2, so we have an equation just in C1. So we've got these two equations, and what we want to do with them is substitute this C2 expression into this C2, so that we have an expression just in terms of C1. So if we do that, then our maximization problem is only with respect to C1 and our maximization becomes this when we do the substitution. 
y1 minus c1 plus y2. And we just close those brackets. So now we want to we want to maximize this expression. So we just have to take the first order condition with respect to c1 and then set that equal to zero. So let's do that. So the derivative of this term is we'll just write as u prime c1. It's just the derivative with respect to c1, uh, but we haven't specified what this utility function looks like. So we'll just leave we'll just leave it in this term that it's the derivative of this function. And once we find out what the utility function is, we can then simply just take the derivative of it. Uh, and then this this second term. We're taking the derivative with respect to c1. So what we we bring out minus uh, 1 plus r because that is multiplying this c1 term. So we have minus. We still have the beta here. So multiplied by 1 plus r. Uh, and then this whole term, we are just taking the derivative of it with respect to c1. But if we notice that this term in the brackets is actually what we've defined as c2 above, we've just rearranged it. So for simplicity, we don't need to uh, do anything complicated. We can just say that this is the derivative of this function, but what's inside the brackets is c2. Uh, so we, we've sub substituted in just so we can do a first order condition with respect to c1. And then when we take the derivative, we substitute c2 right back in. And then because it's first order condition, we set equal to 0. And then we can rearrange this such that we have the derivative of utility of c1 equals to beta 1 plus r multiplied by the derivative of the utility with respect to c2. And now this equation here is what we call the Euler equation, or sometimes pronounced as the Euler equation. I believe the correct pronunciation is Euler equation, so we'll, we'll go for that. And so that's, that's what we find. Now, what does this mean? Well, it says that at the optimum, because we've taken a first order condition, we've maximized utility at this point we have that the marginal cost of savings equals the marginal benefit of the savings. So if we we can view that this u prime c1 as the marginal cost of savings, so if we save, say, so we save a marginal increment at delta units, then this will decrease our utility uh, by the derivative of c1 because the derivative measures the marginal effect of something. So if we, if we save a small amount, our utility will decrease by u, u primed c1, but it will increase by, our utility will increase by this amount, which is the marginal increase of utility from consuming more c2, because we're saving uh, consumption in c1, and then we're gonna spend we're going to spend more in C2, uh, but we multiply by our discount factor and the interest rate, because if we save, we generate interest R, and we weight this utility by our discount factor. That's given by our utility function. So it says that the marginal cost here is equal to the marginal benefit at optimum. Uh, intuitively, this makes sense because we can't then, if we're optimizing, we can't change our saving patterns and our consumption patterns such that it increases our utility because these the marginal impact of that it has an equal cost and benefit so we can't we can't change our consumption patterns to increase our utility so a little bit more on what we mean by this let's what we've actually done is we've done a simple maximization problem of some some indifference curve or some preference relation uh, with respect to the budget constraint and we're looking for our optimality condition where these two are tangent um, but as we've noted in previous videos the slope of the budget constraint is given by minus 1 plus r because this is just how we substitute the cost of substituting consumption across two time periods 
and the slope of our indifference curve is actually given by the marginal rate of substitution or also we can write this in this form the derivative of utility of consumption in period one over the discount factor multiplied by the derivative of utility with respect to consumption in period two and so this is defined as the marginal rate of substitution and what does that mean it basically just measures the amount of consumption we have to change in order to compensate an individual um, such that they are indifferent between two consumption bundles in different period so it just measures if we if we are decreasing consumption of c1 how much do we have to increase consumption of uh, consumption in period two in order to keep this consumer equally happy that's what an indifference curve measures it's all all the combinations that keep us at the same preference or the same utility level so we have this relation well if we notice our so what was our Euler equation it was that u prime c1 equals beta 1 plus r u prime c2 we can rearrange this by dividing through both sides by beta u primed c2 to get that u primed c1 over beta u prime c2. Oops, didn't need another bracket there. Uh, that is equal to 1 plus r. Now, if we make both sides negative, what we see is that this term here is equal to our marginal rate of substitution, as we said there, and this term on the right-hand side is equal to the slope of the budget constraint, minus 1 plus r. So what does the Euler equation say? It just says that our marginal rate of substitution is equal to 1 plus r, or technically minus 1 plus r, but we, we often take the absolute value of the marginal rate of substitution, so we don't have to worry about this negative sign. We, we know they're negative because they're the slopes of these curves. But the Euler equation just says that the these two curves are tangent, and this, this is our optimality condition, and because we, we want to exhaust our budget constraint, so we want to be on the boundary, on this budget constraint boundary, how do we do that? We keep pushing our indifference curves up and to the right until, until they are just tangent to this point and we can't push them any further without no longer being on our budget constraint. So that's what the Euler equation says. It's just a, it's just a time preference relation that says that we need to, this condition needs to hold for us to be at optimum. So that just about wraps up this video, if it was at all useful drop a like and make sure to subscribe to get my future videos, check out the playlist for future videos where we'll be looking at the life cycle hypothesis.